What's up, everybody? Your latest edition of the Coast to Coast podcast starts now, and we're brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. Thanks for being here, Coast to Coast podcast, a bi-week edition, and we're going to shake things up a little bit. Uh, as always, Sherelle McMillan is here. Sherelle, what's up, dude? I'm good. How are you? I- I'm well. Uh, I'm just Joey Powell, and the gentleman also joining us is not a Sean Moran in disguise, but... Joining us again, as we like to do fairly often, as his as his very very crowded schedule allows, Eric Bossy, National Basketball Director for Twenty Four Seven Sports. E Boss, how you living, man? I'm doing all right. How are you guys doing? I uh, mean, I I couldn't. The only way I would be better is if you and I were at the Fifty Fourth Street Grill and Bar, uh, cutting up some meat. That would that would be better. But um, uh, I appreciate you making time for us here on the East Coast tonight as we. Talk about some Carolina recruiting. Shout out to everybody listening, everybody watching on YouTube. If you would, please give us a rating and review. I uh, haven't had any reviews in a while, and you know, we like to know how we're doing. Good, bad, or indifferent. Hook us up. Um, want to make sure that, that you guys are being a part of the show. And we brought Eric in here because the Tar Heels have not played since they beat Syracuse last Tuesday night as we record this. Uh, they will play again this week against Pittsburgh and uh, on the road in Durham on Saturday. But what we thought we would do, is bring in Eric and let him kind of flex his expertise a little bit tonight. I want to talk about a lot of recruiting stuff. Eric has had the chance to see all of UNC's recruits uh, pretty recently. So Sherell had this brilliant idea, as he has wanted to do, and we're going to kind of explore this. So Eric, first things first, man. What is your impression overall of the class of 24 that Hubert Davis has put together uh, over these last couple of weeks so far with uh, Cadeau, Ian Jackson, James Brown, and, and Drake Powell. It's it's an impressive group. Um, obviously, you've got Cadeau, who's arguably the best point guard in the country. You get Jackson, who's ranked what we have number two right now, and mm-hmm. Powell is on the rise. I know my coworker Travis Branham was going gaga over him over the Christmas break, you know, and then James Brown, you know, is is a Nice developmental big who has some touch, ha- has some feel. So it's it's a great class so far. Well, and we had James Brown on the show last week. And shout out to everybody who listened to that and uh, and gave your feedback. We've uh, or Sherelle has passed along the positive vibes back to to James and his family. But just a a very very well thought young man. Um, just is is just so wise beyond his years and has an old soul. But um. Yeah, I want to want to shout out everybody for being a part of that. Sherelle, I will let you dive in because you're going to have a lot better uh, a lot better meat on your questions for for E Boss than I will. So so have at it. Yeah, I wanted to start with Ian Jackson since that is the most recent commitment. Um, so obviously, for those who don't know, you know, me and Eric talk, me and Ben and Eric talk, me and Travis talk, me and Brandon talk, the whole crew. Um, I just, how did you receive how that all went down? Um, because we we just did it inside the commitment where. It kind of seems like the family was, uh, whether or not they were leaning to Kentucky, we'll, we'll never know. Um, but they seem to have kept everything to themselves and um, did a good job of just not spoiling his commitment or, or not closing any doors. So just want to see how you received how that all went down um, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, it's funny you bring up Kentucky because when we first started getting the word that his decision was imminent and stuff like that, there was a lot of Kentucky talk during December, early January and around New York that, you know, that's where he's going. Even up until I'd say maybe Thursday before the commitment, because he committed on, on, on a Monday, right. He committed on, on Martin Luther King, on Martin Luther King day. Right. Mm-hmm. So the Thursday before that I was in um, Springfield, Missouri for the Bass Pro Tournament of Champions. And I actually saw Elliot. And we talked about Ian a little bit and, you know, either he did a heck of a job of, of playing it off or Elliot really didn't seem to think there was much of a chance that Ian was going to be committing to North Carolina at the time. And, you know, these kids are generally pretty in tune with people, but then, you know, we got to talk and we got to check in some things and, and, and things seemed to be shifting. Now, does that mean that they really shifted there over the last week or so? You know, we don't know, but, Definitely Carolina seemed to make up a lot of ground in at least the relatively later stages of the the recruitment. And, you know, it went from something that, okay, we know this kid's announcing the next week or two 
let's start getting ready for what it means for Kentucky and everything to within a couple of days before it was like, Oh crud, you know, this guy's going to Carolina. Let's, 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 let's shift how we're covering this obviously. And, and so a lot of our readers um, in part, because it seemed like it was a long shot um, don't have the familiarity with him. They have what say a, a Cadeau or a pal or even a Brown. Um, why, why is he ranked the number two player for, for you all? And, and what is it that he does so well? And I'll, I'll put that in context. What is the number two ranked player relative to these last couple of classes? Well, you've got a lot of loaded questions here. <laughs> um, so, because because we're going to get into this, and, and I know I've shared this with you, Shrell. You know, Ian has had some struggles this winter. And, you know, the team hasn't been quite as successful as, as you would like to see a team with a number two player in the country. But, um, you know, I've made it pretty clear on the message boards too. 2024 is not the strongest of classes, so there's always a little bit of thing and. And that's not to take away from me because you got to rank people somewhere. He's he's a freaky, freaky athlete, explosive first step, can get to the rim and do some things. Um, streaky shooter from deep, but the shot doesn't look broken or anything like that. I think it's just a matter of he's probably a guy who's been able to rely upon a lot on his athleticism and maybe has used it for a crutch a little bit at times versus developing that skill and getting a little bit more consistent with the jump shot. But, you know, he's pretty lean. He's got to get stronger. But when he's got a rolling, he's really hard to stay in front of. And he could just do some things at 6'4-ish, maybe 6'5", that not many other guys in the class can do. Um, you know, you talk about relative to other classes. Earlier this winter, I guess I guess Thanksgiving weekend, I was able to see Ian play against Trey Johnson, our number one player. And, you know, number one versus number two. And I, I think they were both worthy of that at the time. But – it didn't feel like a number one versus number two matchup. You know, if I'm, if I'm being honest, I don't want to sound like the old hater guy. I felt more like I was at a, a matchup between like, say the number nine and the number 12 player in the country or something like that. You know, this wasn't, you know, a vintage knockdown drag out. Hey, here's two multiple time NBA all-stars going head to head. And that's, that's, that's not to just talk down on them. You know, they are where they are relative to the class. It's just, High school basketball is just a little bit down right now. So I think we see that if you look at the class of 2022, who are all freshmen this year in college, it's not the most freshman mm -hmm. dominant class that we've seen. And you look, you know, the guys who would have been ranked in the top six aren't in college basketball. Oh, I guess Imani Bates is because he, he, he enrolled a year early, but you got Imani Bates, you got Jalen Duran, you got Scoot Henderson, you got the Thompson twins, you got Shaden Sharp, you know, so you got a little bit of a, you know, a handicap. You need to attach those rankings because pretty much anyone in that 2022 class is really ranked at least six higher spots higher than they would have. And that's kind of changes perception a little bit, but it is what it is. And, you know, assuming Ian comes to 2024, we're, we're still 18 months away from that guy getting on campus and there's a lot to change, but love is athleticism. We'd just like to see him get a little bit more edge to his game and, you know, a little bit more competitive fire, which I think hopefully a, a couple losses and, and maybe some people questioning some of those things kind of gets that fire lit back up. So, guys, let's just be honest amongst us. Something Eric said a second ago, who amongst us has not leaned a little bit on our athleticism as a crutch before, right? Like, let's just let's just be real about things. So I don't think Ian's the first one to do that. Um, Eric, I want to I want to pull the string a little bit and, and see if you'll go a little farther. There's been kind of some question I guess around both Ian Jackson's camp and Elliot Cadeau's camp about potential reclasses and both players have said, you know, repeatedly they're going to stay in their respective classes. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Does that help either player? Does that help North Carolina? Is, is one player more of a fit than the other? Or just give me your feedback on, on where you think that conversation can go and, and what the pluses and minuses might be. So I'm not a very big fan of reclassification. In fact, I'm pretty, outspoken against it i don't think it works out very often i think especially with guards yeah yeah and also the, we're talking about two kids that you know by age would probably naturally be in the class of 2023 you know elliot is already 18 mm -hmm. in either just turned 18 or, or turns 18 here in the next couple of weeks so you know they're a little bit on the older side for the class of 2024 but that's really neither here nor there but you know, there's a process towards getting ready for college and regardless of age, skipping a year of development 
to go play college basketball is not something that's easy. I mean, we've seen some guys be okay. You know, Jalen Dern was a pretty good example of a guy who was pretty successful with it last year, and he's doing pretty darn well for the Detroit Pistons right now in the NBA, but he's also like a physical freak of nature. Mm -hmm. Um, And not a lot of nuances game. He's going to run up and down the court. He's going to be athletic. He's going to play with power. Um, You know, when you're talking about guards, there's a lot more nuance to their game, a lot more to learn. Um, I feel like maybe Elliot is a little more, a little bit more polished and a little bit more suited towards making that move. If he was going to make it just because of, his feel, and I think you can drop him into a college game and his intelligence for how to run an offense. I think he's going to be okay. And he's, you know, he's not, he's, well, he's not, you know, super like swole or anything like that. He's not like, he's not like a string bean either, you know, and I think a, a summer in a college weight room would help him. But I think the real key is that if either of these guys is going to do it, there's been a lot of talk about, well, we won't know if they're going to do that until after the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, if I were advising somebody doing this, and this is just, you know, my, in my humble opinion here, if I was going to reclassify early, I would make sure I was in on campus for the summer sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, that practice time with the team, that time in the weight room, when you're already making a difficult skip of a year, that time is going to be really beneficial to be preparing versus going and playing, you know, in the peach jam, which is cool. It's great competition, but that's not preparing you for college basketball, like being on campus around your coaches, around your future teammates is going to do so. So I would think that's a decision that in the best interest of everyone gets made before them, but you know, we're just going to have to see how that turns out. From yeah. a, I just wanted to note from like a schedule standpoint. So UNC typically starts the first session, uh, I think the third Monday in May, and that runs until sometime around like the, I guess the third or fourth Monday in June. Father's Day, um, yeah. Father's Day is somewhere around there. And EYBL and Adidas are having their championships events uh, the week of July 2nd. So it's pretty much impossible for them if they're going to play a full summer to also enroll for the second session at UNC, which will start towards the end of June. So um, I think we'll know pretty I, – I know everybody says towards the end of the summer. I just don't see how a, a kid could play all that's- summer – and then enroll yeah. in school in August. That just that's that's sense. that's what I'm saying. I think yeah. uh, a decision needs to be made of all right. If we're going to do this, what's really best for you know for me? Does it does going out and playing with the with the new heights lightning is that <laughs> who's who is this best for? You know, and that's not that the lightning are great, and there's a lot of benefit from playing that. Yeah. But I think if you do want to make that early enrollment, I think getting on campus as soon as possible if you want to maximize your preparation and being ready for college i think summer school is more important than playing aau basketball well specifically at at north carolina when the the summer tradition has always been playing against you know current players but more importantly like nba vets and guys that have played at north carolina at the highest level and kind of what that cultural transition can do for a kid of 18 years coming right out of high school especially year early that's that's stuff that you can't buy or bottle. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. And it's, it's, you know, you want to have that last go round with your friends, but if you're, if you're making a move in theory, the move for this, I think, you know, let's, let's not pretend about it is guys are wanting to get the NBA as fast as they can. Right? Yeah. So they're wanting to get to these potential big contracts. So if that's really what you're trying to do and that's really the way you want to do it, why would you not want to take, every step possible to maximize your success, your fit and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. so that's where to me doing that would make sense. But, you know, I'm just one opinion. It doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but it's just, if I were guiding someone on that, I would say that session or two on campus is a lot, lot more valuable than playing, playing a three SSB or EYBL session. And again, reclassification is is fairly new to you and see, I can only think of a couple of players. Um, James Michael McAdoo considered it back in the day. Um, And besides that, there really hasn't been kind of once reclass happened, then you could kind of count out UNC. Walker Kessler thought about reclassing. um, But one of the reasons I think UNC ended up getting his commitment was because Roy Williams was like, no, you need to stay in high school an extra year. And I think the family actually liked hearing that kind of brutal honesty. Um, Will Shaver was the first kind of reclass. He enrolled 
um, last last year this time. Yeah. And of course, Heber Davis was like, I'm never doing that again with a mid-year enrollee. So that kind of tells you kind of how I think they feel about it. Um, yeah. And I can't think of, there's never been a player who missed both sessions and enrolled in August uh, that I can recall. Um, that just Jaleel, seems you're setting a kid up and the program up for failure with yeah. regard to that player. Yeah, it's, I think just, it, it's, 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 it's not an easy thing to do. Like it's, we, we've seen it. It doesn't mean people aren't capable, you know, you know, Bagley did it pretty well when he did it for Duke. There's, there's, there's examples of it going either really well or reasonably well, but I just think it's, it's a really tough thing to do and that expectations need to be tempered once something like that is done. Gotcha. So uh, I want to move away from that a little bit and, and talk about uh, back on the court with each of Carolina's four um, 2024 commits and we can talk about 2023 shortly but with, with the 2024 guys just each one in whatever you order you want just kind of tell me top line uh what you think their kind of greatest strength is what they could come in and do right away as a freshman um in, in college at unt sure well we'll start with Cadeau again because i i feel like to me he's the one who seems to have the the clearest path towards kind of a, a seamless transition just because of the characteristics of how he plays he's he's a team first guy and not that these other guys aren't team first guys i don't think any of these guys are, are selfish or anything like that but you know he's built his reputation by making others better um he hasn't built his reputation because he's some 30 point game scorer or anything like that so i think putting him on the floor with some experience and some guys to get the ball to he's he's gonna thrive in that role pretty well um you know i think he's a good on ball defender which doesn't get talked about enough um you know he's pretty athletic too he's a very sneaky athlete explosive first step you know he will get to the rim and and do some damage on some people jump shot is coming along not not broken or anything like that i think it's just a, a reps and a trust thing but I, I like elliot it's it's nothing really flashy or anything about him but he just gets the job done um with ian you know he's that super quick twitch bouncy can make some real highlight, real type plays guy. Uh, certainly not lacking for confidence. Like I said, a little bit streaky as a shooter. So going to keep needing to work on that. But I think the biggest thing for Ian is going to be getting in the weight room and putting on the the mass necessary to be able to play through some contact at, at the college level. You know, um, he can be knocked off his, his drive and his line a little bit already as it is in high school. And obviously – players aren't going to get weaker when he gets there but you know he's the one that if you're talking about hey once it all clicks it could be like holy crap you know like this is this is why this guy was a top two top five guy in the class like he is explosive he can he can score in bunches uh with james brown i think he's just setting and solid solid um he finishes with either hand around the rim which i really really like he has good hands uh pretty good passer out of the low post too i think um, you know, doesn't seem to to fall into the trap of hunting jump shots and stuff like that. that so many young big guys do. And then uh, Powell to me is so I've only watched him on film this winter versus in person, but he's the one to me that's that's kind of the X factor here. Like I think he could be the one where we're looking at a guy that you know, Carolina was excited when they got him. Carolina fan base was obviously excited, but I think we're finding that they didn't realize like hey, maybe we should have been a little bit more excited about this guy. You know, like he's, he seems to me to be a guy who has a chance to, to really, really flourish in the college game and probably come in without quite as much expectations or pressure on him and be given a chance, you know, to get fully invested in, in college, having, you know, both feet in Chapel Hill and really developing. And I really like his long-term ups, upside, you know, he's, he's long, he's athletic. He can defend multiple spots around the perimeter. He's, driver lob finisher and now the jump shots starting to come around um you know i think we're looking at that guy's commitment in a much different light today than we were when he committed back a few months ago uh, again i know sean and shrill hate when i ask this because they don't want to do player comps but i'm going to ask you because you have not shunned me in this question before is it too much low-hanging fruit for um for north carolina fans and inside carolina subscribers to see a lot of theo pinson and drake powell You know, I, I can see the compar comparison a little bit, and, and maybe this is just 
that I had watched a lot more Theo Pinson than I have mm. um, Drake at this point. But, you know, when, when Theo was coming up, he was being hailed as this six six kind of dynamic point guard ball handler guy, which is funny because he ended up playing like as a, like a point four yeah. for stretches at Carolina, whereas Drake is kind of seen more of like a complimentary slasher kind of guy. So I think maybe ultimately the roles kind of get there, but in terms of when I have seen them play, but just Theo not Pinson, now. Pinson's not a guy that would have jumped to mind for me as a comparison for Drake. Okay, fair enough. Um, I can always try to make this as is as easy for for our listeners yeah. as possible. But um, no, if if he's if they're not there yet, then then I'll stop trying to force that. Um, Eric, I want to ask you something else. Uh, you've you've kind of given your first impressions about the players on the trail, but something we asked you when you were here last May is about the perception of Hubert Davis on the trail from kind of a national level, but also from these recruits from the camps of these recruits as you talk to them. What's changed about how folks see Hubert uh, now that he's had, you know, nine months to kind of show like, Hey, we, we went to a, a national championship game my first year. What's changed. I don't know if it's so much as anything's changed. It's just more familiarity with him. Um, I would think that there's a level of, Hey, he could come in as a, as a head coach, right. And tell people, here's how I'm going to run my program. Here's how I'm going to recruit guys. Here's how I'm going to handle communication, stuff like that. And it, and it all sounds great, but you need some time to prove that you're going to follow up on those actions or follow up on those promises with action, right? And I think now he's had a chance to follow up on the promise season with some action. And he seems to be really hand on with the guys, hands on with the guys that he's prioritizing. He seems incredibly accessible. Um, I would say that you know, especially for comparing them to previous tests that there may be a lot more comfortable with using social media or understanding some of the, the impact that some of these things can have on recruiting and stuff like that. And, you know, taking temperatures from guys who are down there on, on the ground level around these kids on a daily basis. And, you know, not necessarily telling people, Hey, here's what we're doing, but, you know, filtering out a little, Hey, what are you hearing out there? through things. And I think that's been a big difference and has been a really key part in their success is they're a much more modern style recruiting staff than they were maybe a couple of years ago. Versus Roy Williams is calling it the crap net and refusing to have anything to do with it, yeah, except for, yeah, yeah, I, and, I'm still fairly certain Roy had a burner account, but whatever. Yeah, and, um, and, and God, and, and people know my affinity for Roy Williams. I think he's a top five college coach of all time. So Let's let's be clear here. I'm not criticizing not at all old Roy in any way, but I think we know he was a little bit set in his ways and pretty apprehensive and not very trusting of new age media. <laughs> You're not going to get any resistance from that here. Uh, something else I want to ask you from last year. You know, when we talked last, we were talking about uh, Gigi Jackson, and I don't want to bring up old you know old news and stir up. Uh, old wounds for folks that listen to the show, but did that change anything when he got that recruit, you know, Hubert Davis gets a, secures a commitment from GG and then everything happened and it fell apart and he ended up going to South Carolina. Did that, did that change his perception on the recruiting trail at all? Or is that just kind of one of those things and, and the winds change and, and, and we move on down the road? I think that w what helped was just getting him. I still think was a huge benefit for Carolina showing that they can be, a contender for, for a prospect like that, who maybe Carolina fans have been starting to think like, Hey, we don't get those guys anymore. Now, obviously we know what happened and everything, but you know, in, in his first year he came in and, and went and plucked a kid right out of his backyard and had to beat some pretty impressive people to do so. I, I think right then he showed that like, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm out here. I, I, I can get things done. And, you know, I think underrated in all this is, is, I think his assistants have been a little bit better than people have expected because you can't get this done without those guys getting in there and building the initial relationships and figuring out, okay, Hey, who do we need to contact here? You know, I know Sean may, it seems did quite a bit of groundwork and homework on the Ian Jackson deal. And I know Brad Frederick was doing a lot of early groundwork and background stuff on Elliot Cadeau. And those guys clearly found the right people they needed to get to found the right 
conversation and topic points that they needed to present the families and the kids with to get things. And there's a lot to be said for that, you know, setting things up for your head coach to come in, you know, and, and, and close it out. Uh, Bossy, I want to ask Sherelle something real quick. Hey, Sherelle, you know what I did Saturday? Um, you were in Chapel Hill? I was after the radio show with Tommy Ashley. Mm -hmm. Um, we should do this the next time Eric's in town, but I, I went to Johnny t-shirt. Um, and I know because he's been back in the days of, of the Bob Gibbons tourney. I, I know Eric Bossy has been to Johnny t-shirt multiple times. Um, I stopped in Johnny t-shirt and I loaded up all, all, all of the Nike dry fit gear. Uh, I got something for every member of my family. Cheryl, you know what else I did when I, when I got that stuff? What's that Joey? I used the 10% off discount that you get on the inside Carolina premium subscriber message boards. Um, so it brought my already great prices down even more. Uh, and then when I came home and got to give each one of my family members their, their respective gifts from Johnny T, they were, they were happy with me. They acted like they liked me, which that's always a plus. You know, you, you got kids, you know how it's like. Anytime you get your family to pretend like they like you, it's a, it's a win that day, right? It's a, it's a big day. Um, so, so go to Johnny T-shirt and your family will like If you go to Johnny T-shirt, I will guarantee you, I will guarantee you or the devil's toenails ain't hot that you can get your family to like you if you go to Johnny T-shirt and bring them back some stuff. Big shout out to Johnny T and those folks. The staff, when I was in there, they were great. Climbed up, got me the sizes of the stuff I needed, rung me out. I was in and out of there, you know, uh, aside from that. And they also have something that hit the interwebs today. Mitchell and Ness have done some new UNC throwbacks. They have the Eric Montross double nault uh, from 93. They have the Rashid Wallace from 95. Uh, good old number 30, Ball Don't Lie. And they have, I can't remember who the other one was, Cheryl. You're killing me. I think he's from Charlotte. War number 33. Number 33. Yeah, Antoine James. See, he he got the ball back up uh, in the bucket after rebounding and putting it back on the glass so quickly, I, I forgot to get his number. Um, but those three guys are in stock at Johnny T-Shirt. Hit them up, johnnytshirt.com, or visit them in East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. They will take care of you. If Johnny T-Shirt don't have it, you don't need it. And like I said, I will guarantee you, if you get something for your family from Johnny T-Shirt, they'll like you again. Take a quick break, let the national guys drop some ads in here. We're talking with... National Basketball Director Eric Bossy here on the Coast to Coast Podcast. We'll be right back. All right. Thanks for sticking around. Appreciate you guys being a part of the show tonight. We're happy to have you. Even though the Tar Heels have not played since last week, we got stuff to talk about. Eric Bossy, National Basketball Director for 24-7 Sports, an all-around great human being is joining us tonight. Uh, he's been kind of resetting because he's seen all of North Carolina's recent commitments for the 24 class. So he's been giving us some great insight. Sherelle, I'll hand it back over to you, sir. Take it away. Yeah, so Eric, uh, in uh, Hubert Davis's introductory press conference, you know, amongst other things that he said, it was that if you haven't played here, meaning UNC, you can't coach here. And that raised a lot of buzz because essentially you've taken your assistant pool from unlimited to about 15 people like on planet Earth. And everybody was like, well, is that a wise decision? And thus far, pretty much every recruit we've talked to had to mention that. Why do you think that's so effective for, for UNC? Um, and have you seen any other place do something like that? North Carolina really prides itself on culture of the program, history of the program. So who is going to be able to better sell that than the people who have come in up through that, right? And really, really know it at its core and understand the core values. So I don't think it's altogether something that other programs don't want to do you know um you know kansas has a, a really really good young assistant jeremy case he played there he he gets it um you know the 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 despised the despised duke guys you know there's a, there's a lot of former duke flavor on that staff right so i don't think it's something that's altogether unusual but to kind of come out and, and throw down and, and say it the way he did. I think it was, you know, it's kind of a, some bravado there and some, some, some chutzpah to, to say, Hey, this is, this is how we're going to do it. If you don't like it tough. Um, but it's working out and it seems like they've got things going, you know, there's been some bumps in the roads here and there, but gosh, it seems like this season's trending an awful lot like last season, some, some, you know, December and January worries. And now we're getting towards February and, and things seem to be starting to click again. Um, you know, you got the, you got the top recruiting class in 2024. Uh, 
the the name is clearly ringing out there and when they're when they're hollering at people the people are picking up the phone for them so it's hard to argue too much with what they've been doing and the decisions that hubert has made so far so i wanted to now jump into 2023 since we led off with 2024 those are the guys who uh, recently committed but zayden high and Simeon wheelchair have both signed um i think maybe we me did a disservice to our fans by not preparing them for the mcdonald's announcements um we had a pretty good idea that Simeon wheelchair wouldn't be on the team um but it, it kind of uh raised the ire of the fan base so to speak just wanted to get your uh, opinion on his season thus far um and what he can improve upon and be ready to do when he arrives in chapel hill in june so it seems that more recently, last week or two, or a couple of weeks, that things are kind of trending back in a positive direction. With Simeone, he seems to be playing much better. Um, you know, Roselle was really pretty rough out of the gates. I don't know if that's adjusting to Mackenzie McBacco making the move over and, and trying to keep everybody happy with everything. But I think the biggest thing for me is, is there's, there's an identity thing. Um, I like Simeon as a scorer a secondary ball handler and a guy just like, dude, just go out there and score, get buckets, take smart shots, and then move the ball when you don't have them. Don't worry about trying to be a point guard or trying to be this or that. Like, you know, can he handle the ball and make some decisions? Sure. But I don't know. I'm I'm not, I want that guy out there to score. So I think that anything that takes away from what he does best is just asking too much may putting him in a bad decision. And, you know, I know people are upset about him not making him, Oh, Bronny took a spot, blah, blah, blah. You know, I am, a, I am a voter. Um, you know, I can only reveal so much about the voting process, but you know, when, when it came down to discussing final guys for those last spots, this wasn't a case of Bronny taking his spot. Um, you know, there were other guys that were in those final conversations for the last kind of couple spots. And they're just, I just don't think there was a, a ton of support for Simeon on the voting committee to, to, to finish out those final roles, you know, and Hey, if that's, that's fuel to his fire and it comes out and turns him into a monster. Great. There's worse things that could happen. Like if he, he's got goals that are much beyond making the McDonald's all American game. Right. Um, if he's able to reach the type of goals that he wants to do, like I, I think he'll making the McDonald's game. If that's the worst thing or not making it, if that's the worst thing that happens to him, then he's going to be in pretty good air, again, pretty good company anyway. And, you know, we'll always be that proverbial chip on the shoulder. Sure, you can use that, but it's it's not the end of the world. It's, you know, that's the thing. When when there's only a certain number of people for something, people are going to get left out. And, you know, if it was Wiltshire and Mikey Williams or Dennis Evans that made the game, then people would be complaining about, oh, well, why wasn't this guy in the game? Why wasn't this guy? And that's just how it goes on those last few spots, but it's certainly not anything to be concerned about for his future or to be, you know, if you're, if you're high on Simeon Wilcher as a Carolina fan, it shouldn't change your opinion on him, whether or not he made the game. So, you know, and if anything, like I said, you're hoping that maybe it just gets him a little bit of extra motivation to get on campus and prove people wrong. Like I've, I've, I've never been in the camp to tell kids, Hey, it doesn't matter. Cause it does matter. It matters an awful lot to these kids. And I, I genuinely feel bad for them when they've been moving for this goal their whole life and, and they don't get it. Right. But that's the thing about life. It doesn't always go how we want to, whether no matter what walk of life we're in or sports or not sports or whatever. So, you know, use it as a little bit of motivation and, you know, keep track of those guys. And you know, I remember Harrison Barnes was notorious for keeping track of the guys who got the better of him. And, and finding a way to get back at them. So you can, you can channel that into positive is where it gets dangerous. If you start feeling like, Oh, the world is against me. No one wants to see me succeed type mindset. Cause that's, that's not how it goes at all. Like we're talking about high school kids here. None of us want to see them fail. You know, I, I talk about it all the time, how in my ideal world, every player out plays their ranking. I would rather have mm-hmm. rated a guy too low than rated a guy too high, right? You know, I'd rather they exceed expectations than, you know, be, be labeled a bust or whatever. So, you know, I don't think it changes anything. Like I said, I think after a bit of a slow start, he does seem to be playing better of late. Um, I, I was kicking myself. I was out at the uh, hoop hall and I got I got pretty sick out there, so I wasn't able to go 
watch his game, but, you know, just tuning in on stuff. He, he looks to be doing pretty good and they seem to be getting things figured out. Um, Zayden high. I've gotten the chance to see, man, I'm getting really long winded here. Sorry guys. Uh, Zayden, Zayden high. I've gotten to see him play quite a bit, quite a bit of times. And I think he's kind of as expected, you know, he's a little bit up and down um, needs to get stronger when he's focused on crashing the offensive glass and, and protecting the rim and scoring some easy buckets first and then stepping out and using the tools he has as a face-up jump shooter. He's pretty good, but also that, that couple's prep team, it's tough. They got so many guys. It's just really hard for any one guy to really stand out or get on any kind of extended run. But for the most part, I've been pretty happy with what he's done when I've seen him play. And he's been about where I would expect him to be. And I, I still remain, even though, the stats aren't great or anything like that this year. They're not like mind blowing. I, I remain pretty bullish on him being a pretty good college player. How well, much? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. I, I was going to say, how much for someone like High? We understand with, with Wilcher that he's always played kind of at the highest level possible. But for High going from his high school team in Texas to a place like Compass Prep, how much can that accelerate his growth? I think it it's, it helps in a few ways. One, he's learning to play a role alongside other talented players and not just being able to go out and shoot as many times as he wants or grab every rebound he wants just because he's bigger and more athletic than everyone, like he was back home in Texas. Um, so there's not, there's some to that. But also sometimes I wonder, you know, with a guy like this who's in the process of developing, you know, maybe it wouldn't have been so bad to be home and be like the featured guy. Like there's still something to be said for having the burden of knowing you got to be out the guy to go out and get 25 and 10 every night and the confidence that you can develop through that. So there's, 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 there's positives and negatives with all of it. Um, you know, I know the guys at compass really, really, really well. Um, I think they do a great job down there. I know he's getting pushed. I know that he's getting coached hard. Uh, and obviously playing a, a bunch of talent in, on a daily basis and practicing just in the games that they play. So I think overall it's a pretty positive thing, but, you know, I don't know that it's – I don't. I think we need to see a few years more, especially since we've gotten so focused with kids going to these preps now. I think we need a few more years to see do they seem to be doing better coming out of there than they do out of traditional high schools. You know, um, you know, Montverde is kind of an anomaly out there with success they've had with all the highly, all the high draft picks they've had that seem to be doing pretty well. Um, you know, we haven't seen anyone else yet do it on that level. And, and Compass Prep is still pretty new to the block. But, you know, I, I think overall it's a pretty positive thing. Just uh, – there's a lot to be said, like I said, from learning to play with other talented players and, and knowing that you've got a role and understanding that, hey, I may not be able to score quite like I want to. I want to go back to talk a little bit about Wiltshire. I think, you know, you made the point about how he's kind of been up and down. And um, with Russell, he's kind of the primary ball handler. How do you think he fits at UNC with, with either Cadeau or Seth Tremble? And and what does he need to do to be an immediate impact player? Or what does he need to do instantly so that he can eventually become an impact player sooner rather than later? Yeah, so to, to, to keep going, like I like the idea of him playing with a more traditional point guard, um, a more pass first, get other guys going, because that frees him up to run off some screens. I feel like he's a much better shooter coming off the of screens than, than off the dribble. Now I'm just – this could just be me making up my mind, but it just looks a little bit more clean. Um, I like him being able to, you know, catch, rip through, one, two dribble, get to a spot, get where he needs to be or get to the rim. And I like that freedom of it. You know, like I'm not saying he can't handle the ball and he's he's a he's a good enough passer, but I just think he's more suited to playing off the ball just because his scoring to me is his strength. And the more you can free him up to do that, I think the better it is for for not only him, but also for a team. Yeah, I like him. I like him going downhill too. I was I was waiting for Joey, but yeah, it, yeah. At, at the times I've seen him play best is when he takes the ball, um, comes off a screen and just puts his head down and goes to the rim. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dudes, the dudes. I mean, he's, he's built a, for that. Physically, he's yeah. built for that. Yeah, yeah. He's 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 a guy who is at his best 
aggressive in your face attack mode kind of guy um you know versus worrying about where the other four guys are and making sure they're in the right spots at all the time i do dude just get it get it go and you know you need guys like that and you know i i hope there's no one out there who thinks that's you know some kind of disagreement because I, I i like him as a scorer a lot you know i just you know i just hope i'm not coming off as some type of uh old man i've been doing this for too long hater tonight i feel like i feel like i feel like these days that people think i don't think anyone's any good and i actually think they're all pretty darn good i like these guys a lot i you know and i want to see them succeed and i'm I'm really kind of curious to see how this kind of new breed of of guys coming into carolina works out you know this this it's you know they're setting up a little bit of a of a new jersey new york city pipeline here i'm 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 really curious to see how it all works out for him because if it that goes pretty well with these first couple guys you know that could be a pretty interesting deal for carolina down the road you're reading my mind so one of the things i love about shrill and sean is is we've done this long enough where they've started kind of figuring out where i'm going to go next and i want to ask you do you think that hubert davis and his staff can kind of maintain uh the momentum that they've built you know i think one of the things was Sherell so eloquently put last year after the final four run, it wasn't going to pay off immediately. The payoff was going to come, you know, in the 24 class and beyond. So I want to ask you, you've seen this before at other places with new coaches. You've seen it at places before with old coaches. Do you think North Carolina can keep this going? Yeah, it's North Carolina for heaven's sake. Like, you know, there aren't very many schools that are better positioned than a place like Carolina. Um, to, to, to keep things going. I mean, they're a blue blood, you know, blue bloods have advantages out there. They've got history. They've got pros, they've got resources, they've got facilities. You've got all that. So the key is again, and, and to circle back to what I was speaking about with Hubert earlier, as long as you, as long as you come through and deliver on, on what has been promised, then you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay, and, and I don't get the sense that they're out there, out there, promising everything, anything wild. Now you know we're in a we're in an entirely new age. The the transfer portal is what it is. You know NIL is what it is. But you know I think North Carolina is in a pretty good space to compete on all those levels and in any way that needs to be done. Fair enough. I, I was actually going to ask one one NIL question. Do do you see that kind of being the pulse? mover that that folks thought it would you know a year ago a year and a half ago do you see that still being as big of a thing or is it still just you know uh, oh, it, a, a nice <laughs> a nice garnish or a, or a side side item no it it, it 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 definitely matters um for sure like when we interview kids i'm sure you guys run this you ask about it and i say oh no it's not really a big deal you know i'm not i'm not too concerned about that you know my family's running, man when these kids, for the most part, and their families are calling coaching staffs, you better believe that's a very early, very early question in the conversation. And now it's not going to it's not going to matter for everyone. But there there are going to be kids out there that if say, hey, this school promises me one hundred dollars in NIL, they'll go somewhere else. that's a bad fit for one hundred and one. It's just it's just a fact of life. It's It's going to happen in some cases. And. I think we're going to need a few more years because what we've got right now is we've got numbers being floated out there, you know, I'm sure. But they're not real. Uh, That's the other thing. It's like, like, you know, the, the, we've, we've heard Gigi Jackson got promised $3 million in NIL to go to, to go to South Carolina. You know that, I mean, maybe he did, if he did awesome for him, that's great. Right. But we don't know, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's starting to be some rumors of, of a couple schools where, the athletes in general aren't very happy because what they were told they were going to get in NIL and they're not getting anything clear to and they're and they're thinking about taking legal action. We just saw, I mean, look what Florida just went through on the on the football side. What's the kid's yep. name? Jaden Rashada. Rashada, yeah. Yep. They, they promised that kid $13 million in NIL. Come on, man. It's, no just, it's paying, funny money. No, Shout out no, to Bomani nobody, Jones. That's funny money. Nobody's paying $13 million to a high school kid. Come on now. I don't I don't care. So We've got to find out what's being reported, what's being speculated versus what numbers are actually getting. But the key is if you're delivering what was promised, that's that's all that matters. And, you know, I think a program like Carolina with the tradition and the intense interest 
it's probably always going to be in a pretty good NIL shape because I'm, you know, there's going to be interest in, in helping those kids out and there's kids can move the needle locally and maybe have to do a few more, you know, smaller things versus one big thing, but they're going to be okay. But yeah, NIL matters. And I think for the kids and the families who maybe aren't quite as sure of their pro future as, as they will let you believe they are, it matters a lot more. Whereas the kids who are, you know, how do I explain this? Let's say the goal of all these guys is to make tens, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in the current structure of the NBA, right? NIL is important, but if you're really going to get to that level, do you want to jeopardize potentially that much money down the road for an extra 50 or a hundred thousand dollars a year for the next two years? You know, if, if, if you make it where you're going, it's, it's in inconse- it's inconsequential, but if it screws it up, like that money is not going to be enough to make, to make up for that mistake. So it's going to be really interesting to, to see, okay, how does that all work? How does the transport? Like, I think we're kind of all over the place right now. I think eventually we're going to get kind of a, a slow kind of regression back to the mean and, it won't be quite as volatile as it seems like it is right now, but, you know, we're still just learning. And the big key is, you know, sooner or later, someone's going to figure out people are going to start requesting like tax documents or something to figure out like what are guys actually getting, but until we really, really know what guys are getting, it's, it's going to be hard to say, but yeah, NIL matters. <laughs> Heck yeah, it matters. Yeah. Uh, shout out to a couple of guys who we've covered in the past who got multiple payments from multiple schools back in the day. Uh, kind yeah. of a kind of that coming back all over again. So hey, if, if they're gonna give it to you, take it. Um, and the other thing, it, it's only eighteen months old. I know it feels like it's been around forever, but it's still a fairly new, you know, concept. Um, so before we let you go, I wanted to kind of play it forward a little bit and talk about um, twenty twenty four somewhat in twenty twenty five. Um, so the first question is twenty twenty five is seems like pretty loaded at the top. Um, and obviously there's a long way to go to discover prospects, but are you starting to see more of the traditional depth in that class that you would expect from, you know, frankly, a, a good high school class, you know, back in the 2010s? Um, and then yeah. the other, and then the other question just is, is 2024. Um, do you think there's still a lot of good players to unearth that maybe we haven't been seen yet? I hope so. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, Surely there's, there's going to be some guys to develop. There's going to be some guys that come along that were like, you know, holy cow, this guy's better than we realized or, you know, come on. Right. You know, I don't know if we're going to have any Vaughn wafers just showing up out of nowhere anymore. We're like, Whoa, who was that guy? And he walks out at the weekend, a top 25 player in the country. And that, I know that was a pretty obscure and real old reference for people back there, the Keaton Vaughn wafer. We'll and allow it. Wanna, we'll allow it. If you want to Google them, but you know, I mean, we're still seeing it. I mean, look at, look at Cody Williams. Who's going to Colorado. That dude was a fringe top 100 player this time a year ago. Now he's in the top 10 and maybe even competing for the number one spot in 2020, 23. So there's definitely going to be some guys that, that emerge and come along. And I'm, I'm, I'm here for all that. Like I, I want to see it. Like I, I, I just, gosh, you know, I've I've been doing this for 20 plus years now and I've always prided myself and told myself, you know, I'm not going to be one of those old bitter guys. And I feel like saying over and over again that, Hey, these classes right now just aren't that good. I'm turning into that old bitter guy. And I don't want to be that guy. That's, that's not me. I don't want to be him. So I'm hoping that 25 offers a little more promise, you know, clearly with, Cam Boozer and Cooper Flag. We've got two potentially special kids right there at the top. And I think a lot of the excitement over them at the very, very tippy top of the class has kind of got a lot of early, like, oh, 25 is going to be way better than these other classes. But you know, we need to we need to let that play out a little bit. It's looking okay. Um, you know, still too early to know about the great depth, but certainly with those very first couple guys at the top, you know, they seem to be a along the more traditional lines of, of what you would expect to see from like a number one or a number two player, but it's early. There's a lot of the race left to be run and, you know, who knows, but 24, I feel like I've been a little bit encouraged with kind of the back end depth is starting to look a little bit better than I was hoping to be 
23 kind of is what it is, but I, I think we're going to see a lot of shakeup between what we see today in the class of 24 and what we'll see in April, May of 2024 when we're doing those final rankings for that class. And I feel like these guys are, are kind of getting some steam back. They're going to be going through a second kind of more traditional spring and summer, which none of these past few classes ahead of them got to get. So I think that's going to be really helpful for them. And, and I'm really hopeful that we come away from the summer going, man, I don't know why we were so concerned about the class of 2024. Sure. I, I hear a guy that's not, not the old get off my lawn guy. I hear a guy that's seen some recruiting sh stuff and, and is, is tempering his, uh, is tempering his judgment and, and feeling like, Hey, there probably is one or two diamonds left in the rough out there. Yeah. There's yeah not not Mitch, maybe there's not a Mitch McGarry walking through that door. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty even as it is. Personally, I'm not a, I'm not like a flaming hot take guy. You know, like I've, <laughs> I've never tried to move the needle by being obnoxious. Um, I'm just obnoxious on my own without intentionally doing it. Um, you know, but I do think that having the experience of being around for a little while is is valuable. I've I've learned a lot over the years. You know, I've learned where I've made mistakes, and I've learned it. I'm still going to continue to make mistakes because we're, we're talking about high school kids and there's so much that we, we don't know about with them, but you know, also I remember in this is, is we are talking about high school kids. So while it's okay to, to speak openly and, and fairly and, and give criticism where it's needed, we also need to, you know, remember to, to not get too out of control with it and, and saying anything. Cause again, they are still high school kids. And also, you know, I mean, I like doing what I do for a living and, you know, I don't want to go out and just crush all these kids and have to deal with them and their families. That wouldn't be any fun. Like it's, you know, I, I want to see them succeed. That's why I've been doing this for so long is because it's a lot of fun to see these guys either live up to expectations or exceed expectations or whatever. So, you know, remaining hopeful with 2024 that it's, it's going to be a big spring and summer for those guys. Hey man, real talk. Um, in a world that involves uh, multiple layers of human beings, ultimately getting back to teenage players, you've been right more than you've been wrong. And you've always given some really good insight to us. So um, yeah, man, keep at it. It's a, uh, it's great to have you. I think you, uh, you bring a lot to the college basketball world, not just in recruiting, but just in general and kind of understanding and how projecting what these kids may do for programs and what their futures might look like. So Big fans of, of eBoss here and uh, definitely thankful for you making time for us on the Coast to Coast podcast. Eric, anything else you want to you wanna drop before we get out of here? I know you've got the podcast going on and and you're always writing stuff for 24-7, for including some, some random drive-bys on Inside Carolina's premium boards. Anything you want to plug before we let you go? No, no, I just I just want to get to Johnny T-shirt myself. You know, those 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 throwbacks are sounding pretty good to me. You know, I you know, I, I used to, I used to rock a throwback jersey back in the day, every now hey, and again. But but no, it's always amazing. fun being on here. The inside of Carolina community is great, and I appreciate you guys you guys spending some time with me. Yeah, man. Well, safe travels. Keep doing the great work you're doing. We'll look forward to to everywhere that we see and hear and read your work. And and again, just thanks for making time for us here on the Coast to Coast. Sherelle, you got anything before we get out of here? No, nah, thanks, Eric. Appreciate it, and hopefully we'll see you on the road come April. And hey, shout out to uh, Sean Moran who is who is on assignment, but just, uh, it, man, his, his world just had some things happen. So we'll talk to Sean very soon. Uh, but for Cheryl McMillan, for Eric Bossy, I'm Joey Powell. Shout out to Johnny T-shirt for sponsoring, to John Siegley for producing. And we will catch you next time on the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. Late.